Hi, and welcome to another episode of What I Wish I'd Known, the Google Partners podcast. I'm your host, Alex Langsher. And on today's podcast, we're going to talk with Jean Lin, global CEO of Isobar, about what she wished she'd known about managing her career, what it takes to build a global digital agency, and leadership in the hyper-competitive world of digital and media. You know, I'm really excited to speak with Jean, as she is one of those people that you just know has stories to tell and experiences to share. Based in Shanghai, she leads a global workforce of 6,500 people spread across 45 markets. In 2009, AdAge recognized her as one of the global women to watch. In 2013, she was named by Campaign Asia as one of the top five CEOs. And most recently, Jean was named to the jury president for the 2018 Cannes Lyon Digital Craft. I'm super excited to have you on the Google Partners podcast, Jean, and welcome. Thank you, Alex. And hi, everyone. Really happy to be here. Fantastic. Jean, can you maybe give some of the backstory about how did you go from an account executive at Ogilvy in Taipei to leading a global digital agency headquartered out of Shanghai? Well, that's a very long story, so I'm <laughs> sure not sure is. if you have time to finish it all. But I, I like working in the advertising business. So I study foreign languages and literature in college, and I never thought that I would go into media, marketing, advertising business. But what I always knew is that I, I love to tell stories, and I love to influence and give inputs to what people think of a certain things on perspective. So after graduation, I got into Ogilvy as an account executive. I thought I'm going to retire there because I really enjoy working at Ogilvy. It's a great agency. Yeah. At the time when I had my daughter, so I was on maternity to leave at home. And if you're Chinese, you will know that um, during the months after you gave birth to the baby, there are many things you can't do. So, for example, so my mom was there watching me, making sure that I don't read books because they believe that reading book after you gave birth to a baby is going to damage your eyesight. I'm a reader. I, I just can't stand it. So I will go to another room which my mother didn't know that I had a computer and internet there. So I would say I would take a nap there, but actually I was serving online. That was the moment when internet really started to make some impact to the industry of marketing, communications, and overall in people's lives. And I was just serving online, just thinking this thing is going to change how people communicate and how the world connects. This is so exciting. I think I, I need to do something just to make sure that it, it satisfies my own curiosity. So after getting out of the maternity leave jail, <laughs> when I get back to work, I, I start thinking of this idea and I think that I need to start a business. I need to work with people so that I can explore what digital can be. So I started my own agency, and in a few years' time, I, I sold the agency to today's Dentsu Aegis Network, and I stay on. I'm still very happy. I feel that I'm still building the company that I was trying to build years ago, and here I am. And I think that's probably a good jumping off point for me to kind of ask my question that I do of all our guests is that, Gene, the premise is... You know, what you wish you'd known. So my question to you is, you know, what would be the top five things that you wish you'd known if you were to speak to your younger gene self about starting off in your career and managing a digital agency? So, so, so I guess I, I have a very um, Chinese philosophical view about career and everything. And I feel that this is a journey that you really get to know yourself better. And when you know yourself better, you can be a better leader and actually it helps to make an impact to the way you progress your career. So there are a few things I want to say to myself as young Jing. I think the first thing is really that it's okay to be afraid. You always do well when your faith is stronger than your fear. 
So stand for what you believe, be courageous, and be comfortable. I think that's the first thing I will tell myself, thinking of what I've been through in the past decades. Can you maybe share with our listeners uh, how that might have manifested itself in your work career? So not being afraid is, I mean, this happens many times, almost every day, right? I, I think the, the first thing about this is, so I work for a digital agency. Digital is the area that's changing every day. And every day you wake up in the morning, you know that there's just new things that you don't know today that's happening, that's maybe changing the world. So if you let your fear drive everything that you do, you limit your opportunity to explore the world and really get into areas that are really interesting and can make a potential impact. So even back to the time when, when I started my business, uh, I remember sitting in the room and I was like, I, I cannot find the company that I want to work for in this area because this is new. So I may need to start a company so that I can fulfill what I feel is out there to, uh, for us to explore. I remember I feel quite afraid because I've never started a business. Actually, I never really thinking of starting a business, even while I, I was starting it. I remember my husband said to me, you know, what can you lose? Don't be afraid. Just, just go on and do things that you believe. And I think that's one of the best advice that he has given me. And with, with his support, I think I, it's easier for me to pass through this part. But if I hold on to the fear and the risk that I think of at that time, because actually I, ha I had a very good career at Ogilvy at that time. I'm very comfortable. I know what to do. My clients like me. I can see my career path. But I didn't let the fear at that time limit myself going into building something extremely different and now looking back is a very good decision. So I think stick with what you believe. Try to make it work. Don't let the fear carry you away. That's very important in today's business world, especially when all the jobs that's there in the market is very different today versus five years ago and also very different 15 years from now if you look back from today. So I want to understand is, is the fear that you speak about, do you still feel that today? And if you do, is it the same type of fear or has it shifted based on the a clear success that the company has had or, or do you feel that you're kind of still in that early mode of putting something together and always having to reinvent? I feel that, um, you know, there are two aspects to this. I think the fear and the excitement, the fear and excitement actually come hand in hand. I think I'm really lucky working in a digital industry that's always evolving because, you know, I still wake up every morning knowing I know nothing about the world. And that's quite interesting and exciting. At the same time, it makes you be a little bit afraid. But, but I sort of like the feeling of being a little bit afraid because that means something new is coming up, something with potential may happen today rather than repeating what you know and repeating what you know you can do well. So to answer your question, Alex, that happens every day still today. And I sort of start to enjoy the type of fear that I experience because it brings about opportunity and potential. Right. What would be your second point? So my second point is... You said in the beginning that we live in this hyper-competitive world, right? Mm -hmm. And when, when this happens, you will always look around and see what the competitors are doing, what's happening around you, and you see a lot of people really smart and doing a lot of stuff and really doing well. My advice to the younger Jing is I realize what others do for the most of the time, it's irrelevant to what matters to me. 
meaning while we have to watch over and understand the context we're operating, the most important thing is really to believe in your own passion and do what you know is right. Because at the end of the day, whatever happens to other people and what they do and spend their time, sometimes is irrelevant to what matters to me. So I hear many of our guests say something similar to this. So uh, please only take that the right way that, you know, you have to follow your inner voice. You have to be true to your vision. Think through uh, and follow through on your dreams. I hear this before, but when you're in a situation where you're trying to start up a business or, uh, you know, leveraging a product like uh, a Google AdWords platform, it kind of does matter because you're in a competitive environment against other people. So there's some table stakes there. So can you help us understand a little bit about how this point ladders up to delivering those services? Right. So there are many aspects you can think about it. And, and I want to be clear that I didn't mean the competition is irrelevant or the context is irrelevant. Like you said, it's very important in this context and you want to make sure that whatever you do are relevant for other people. I think this is really coming back to being a leader and especially a female leader in my instance. As a woman, especially a woman in the business world, a lot of time there will be reference point that's being pointed to you as that's the way people do things. So for example, when, when I started my career, when I started the business, my mom, who is a very nice and courageous lady, but she had this thought and she was like, you just had a baby, right? She was two months old. Do you really want to um, start the business? Look, look at what others do. You can wait for another three years maybe. And when the family and the situation is more stabilized, then you can go on and do things that you would like to do, which is a very practical advice. But if I take that advice, the agency will not happen and I may not be where I am today because a lot of things that you know intuitively need to happen is related to timing of when that will happen. So what others do as a norm, as a woman who just gave birth to a baby girl, may not be the norm that you want to uh, hold on to at a moment when you're passionate about something, when you know the timing is right, because you will find ways to make that work. Things like this actually happens every day. So you know, if, if you feel that there is a new product and service that, that need to go on the space. For example, three, four years ago, we started to talk at Isobar about a notion we call brand commerce. That actually isn't, doesn't mean that brands doing e-commerce online. What, what we always believe is that because customer experience is so important, to a point, the seamless experience I need to create in the world you have to find a way to bring the brand inspiration and commercial transaction closer together as a seamless and compelling experience. We start to talk about that. There are a lot of different notions and people's perception on what a brand commerce experience could be and, and what's the opportunity for innovation in the brand commerce space because commerce as a word make you feel that it, it's just the, the transaction aspect of it. But we believe it's more than just a transaction aspect of it. We believe in today's world, if you want to do experience-led transformation for your organization, it's really, really important not just to putting customer at the center of it, but putting the last mile when your customer interact with you as a center of how you construct your strategy. That will enable a much better customer experience for anything to happen for your business. So three years later, I think today, there are more people talking about experience-led commerce and how that may create an impact 
to the future digital transformation for business and brands. But looking back four years ago, when we start to discuss how that will work, it's at a very different time. And that's not what others do because a lot of agencies and brands want to sort of steer away from getting involved in commerce in the sense that they feel that commerce is about logistic. So I guess this question just, you know, reiterate is that competition is important. But when you see a point when you, it feels that it's slightly different from what others think or do, you need to dig deeper and really understand what that means to you. Gene, so love the idea. I'm interested to understand from a business perspective, what have you found uh, works best, particularly as the organization is doing what it needs to do so that it's servicing its clients and it's delivering on its remits and cash flow is working for you. What are some of the approaches that you use to be able to get the business to start that shift? And and, and convinced that this is the right way to go. Well, whatever the others are doing, we've got this idea about brand commerce. So we're going to sell this idea internally and we're going to start to make that happen. What do you find are some of the structural impediments that you need to overcome to, to move the organization in the direction that you want to point it to? So I think there, there are a few things. Obviously, there, there are normal business process and practices you have to do whenever you want to start a new product and service in your organization. So those type of thing you have to do, right? And you need to follow all the MBA processes to ensure that those are the hygiene factor that you have to go through. But but I think, you know, philosophically, when you think of this, my, my view is always that you have to find the liberating agents in your organization. Because these are the people that will be happy to challenge the status quo. You need to create an environment that you can protect those liberating agents and enable them to do more in the process so that we can take the evolution to a point where it doesn't have impact to the current mainstream business that you have. So... It's really important that um, as a leader, you enable that to happen in your organization. That's great, Jean. What would be your next point? My next point to my young self will be, it's okay to be rebellious. And I wish my 19-year-old daughter is not hearing this podcast. (laughs) Nor my 17-year-old son. Yeah, but, but it's really okay to be rebellious. Because all people with, with creativity really need something to rebel against. You need to look at something and you say, I want to be different. I want to be slightly different. I want to be better. I want to be very different. That That's when you have an opportunity to create something new. And it's really okay to be rebellious. And how would you channel that rebellion in a work environment? So if you're dealing with creative types or you're dealing with just employees in general and you recognize that a certain edge is really important to keeping the organization on its toes, first of all, how do you communicate that we were looking for that without it becoming something that kind of works against the processes that are really required for the organization to scale. Right. So I want to go back to what I said earlier about the liberating agents. Mm -hmm. So obviously it will be a disaster if everyone, so we have 6,500 people right now in our organization. If everyone at every point they feel that they want to be rebellious to either the process, the direction, the purpose, the clients, and the thing that they're doing, it will be a disaster. So the the key thing here is to choose what are the things, as part of the value of the company, what are the things that you allow for those rebellion thoughts to happen? And when it's done right, what we'll call that pioneering, or we'll call it innovation. So I guess guess the key thing here is how you channel the energy, the rebellious energy, 
of the organization to focus on things that you want to innovate about and create an environment or a way to sort of help those liberating thoughts and liberating agents in your organization to co-create things so that their energy is used in the right place to push the company forward. And as a leader in the company, so I understand you're, you're going to focus that energy. As a leader in the company, what are, what are some of the things that you do to embody that spirit and to say that it's okay, you know, in measured ways, but it's okay. It's something that we're looking for. So, for example, we, we have our global innovation accelerator called Now Lab. When it started was because at the point we found out that anything that's prevailing in Korea, in mobile, will be something that's actually quite interesting and scalable in China in nine or 12 months. So one of the thoughts that we had at that time is, as a global organization, to truly believe in borderless, how can we ensure that we channel the energy of everybody to focus on creating cross-border innovation opportunity. So does that, that's a starting point of our Now Lab. The interesting part of our Now Lab is that, while a lot of company and agency may have a lab set up, the people in, now lab, in their lab most of the time are regular staff. So there are people that are being assigned to Now Lab as part of the hiring structure. Our thought is different. We Now Lab is an initiative, a community, and also is something that people can rotate into. So if you have an interesting idea, you can pitch that to your management. And if it does have some merits, although it could be steering away from the majority of the, the business engagement that you're working with, but if it does make sense in creating a greater customer experience, then a, a smaller group of people could get together and focus on those things in the Now Lab as part of the Now Lab initiative. So you can rotate in, you can ro- rotate out. In that way, you create the, the right forum for the innovation energy to happen in the organization and for people to freely work with people from other country or in the teams that you've never really met in your normal day-to-day life. That's a mechanism, for example, for us to channel the, 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 the drive to be different and making sure that that creates value for us. So as a result, many of our more interesting projects come out of this proactive Exploration. So you, you may know that um, Fast Company a few months before rated us as the 10 most innovative companies in the world for AR and VR. When the AR and VR experiment starts, it was much, much longer before everybody starting to focus on this area. But that comes from an innovation thoughts coming from a group of people saying that this is going to change the way experience being presented to people. This is putting the consumer at the heart of the experience. There's something in it that we need to be rebellious about how this can be done. So all the initiatives here actually come from a mechanism that should allow those energy to collaborate and happen around the world. It's interesting. You've you created a structured process for innovation to occur. Yeah. Yeah, great. What would be your next point? I think the next point is this artificial intelligence is going to take over the world. It is obviously something that's quite common right now in discussion about how much work will be automated or, you know, the the job will disappear because of everything that's happened in the technology space. I I believe in the power of human beings. And and the way I see it is that I think the power of being human, realizing empathy. And empathy is something that can never be outsourced 
or automated. So if you stay true to understand the world in the context and under human behavior in the context that you're living in, I will never believe that you'll be out of the job. And that's a very important point when we're walking into an increasingly technology-heavy world. What can you share your thoughts on the intersection between AI and human creativity? Because I think that's a there's so much that's left to be written and understood about that. So what's your perspective on that? So, so I think AI can help creative industry a lot. Um, so, for example, we in China have started to do this um, AI generated packaging design. So, in the past, it may take three to six months to design various packaging for a client before it go into production. Now, when it's done in the right way, hitting a button, you can have 5,000 design in two seconds. That saves a lot of time for creative people to really think of how they can utilize what they understand about human truths and come up with more data-inspired ideas. And I think that's a huge opportunity when you combine human empathy with the power of machine, because the data and the insights are there, but it needs to be told in a way that actually the audience and the people feel that they're understood. Gene, if we push away the side of AI on this empathy and AI uh, discussion, and just focusing on the empathy and yourself, and if I go back to earlier comments that you made about you know, being a woman in this industry and your trajectory through it, how have you found empathy to be effective in your career? Empathy doesn't mean that you don't deal with things. Empathy means that when you know you have to deal with things, you will put yourself in other shoes and understand how to be kind. And I think that's really important in today's business world because we're all human beings and people get unhappy if a direction is not evolving to the way that you want it to be. So if I'm somebody that actually doesn't fit into an organization, then and today I will be terminated, I wouldn't feel very happy about it. That's something that everybody will understand. But I guess the key thing there is how can we ensure that when an organization have empathy, look at the process to make it in a way that it take care of somebody as well as a wider organization. What's the best way in creating an empathetic environment, but not an environment of inaction or just want people to be happy all the time? Because that's actually not fulfilling the high-performing indication of a good organization. What would be your next point? My next point is, I don't remember who who said this, but but this is something that I, I always take note to myself and I think is really, really important for me. Is I, I think both success and failure are not final. So when you're successful, don't think of your success as final. When you fail, don't think of the failure as fatal. Because the, the, the thing is that our life right now, especially moving into the digital economy and also the fast pacing world around us, our life is consists of many small success and small failures. A lot of time, people get carried away with the feeling and impact of a particular success or some failures. So you either get too arrogant or very depressed easily. I think we all need to remind ourselves that both success and failures are not fatal and they're not final. So what we have to do is to continue to move on the journey and really, really look at us with genuine honesty, that will make us a better person and that will actually make our organization a much better organization that will be able to embrace 
success without arrogance, and also tolerate failure without looking at it with、uh, scrutinization and criticism. You know, I hear you on this, and I think、uh, again, this is one of those areas that you probably get violent agreement from most people. That said, you know, the data is pretty conclusive that you know humans have, you know, they're driven by this sense of loss aversion. My my question to you is, where have there been situations where, you know, there's been a, a failure that you've had to kind of move beyond, and、um, how did you do that, and how did you You know, rally the troops behind that, and conversely, how did that get integrated into the organization as a, as a learning lesson, so that you actually do learn the lesson from that failure? So when when I started the business, there are two divisions in what I want to do. One one division is a professional service provider helping brands to do digital marketing and branding online. The second part of the business is a, is an experiment that we task ourselves for because we want to understand how social in the internet age at that time will have an impact on how brand can be built and how people's perception can be formed. So we actually built a platform called FreeChat.com. It's You know, thinking about it today, you think that's silly, but at that time, it's actually a chat service that enable people to talk online and share stuff. So it, it, it's an experiment that we run for the course of twelve months. Actually, we accumulated quite a lot of Chinese audience actually talking on the chat platform. It, it appeared to be a failure because you you never heard of it today. <laughs> yeah. But I think that that's a really interesting experiment. It's a failed experiment in the way that when we do that, we don't know what the business model is. We don't know how it takes to build a scalable、um, service solution that you need to manage and enable every day. We didn't know how a service like this will have impact to the parts of our professional service business. So, so there, there are a lot of things that we didn't think through. We just feel that we want to experiment. We want to see how that works. We want to understand how it feels and what it takes to manage a service that actually not a B two B service, but service open to、uh, general public. So we, we've learned a lot in the process. But at the end of the twelve months, we decided that we want to close this experiment. Mm-hmm. Because it's, it's it's eating up all the cash that we have, and it, it appears to be that we are a good professional service firm, but that doesn't mean that we're a good product development and maintenance team. And these are two very different mindset that require different expertise and different process to manage the business. So one way of thinking about this is that it fell, it burned your cash. It fell, but I think the the learning that we have from the process was tremendous. It helped us today, even if the team were coming from the day when we run free chat. It is you understand now so much better and be very emphasized when we're running and designing a service for our clients. A digital service take the kind of process understanding commercial model. And really understanding how that can make an impact、mm-hmm. to the business model is extremely important in today's digital economy. You know, I'm going to paraphrase Colin McGregor, who said uh, uh, something along the lines of、uh, "either succeed or I learn," and I think that's the the message here. I know from、uh, own experience that. You know, going into software development, that we were just had no clue what we we're doing, but it taught us so much. And even though we exited the business, I think that it actually the lessons that we applied from that really accelerated other parts of the business. And that's that's a key thing is to do a post mortem. I mean, it's when when things don't work out the way you expected, sit down and do that post mortem. It sounds that's exactly what you did in your case too. Yeah, that that's so important to really understand. That everything happened in the journey has a value.
Right. And then make sure that that is shared out within the organization, too, so that it becomes part of the explicit knowledge uh, and, and, and awareness within, the, within all staff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Jean, thank you so much for this. It's been really interesting and I appreciate your time. I know it's very precious and I think our listeners have, uh, have gained a lot through this. If they want to reach out to you and ask you any follow-up questions, uh, what would be the best way for them to get in touch with you? Well, they can, you can always get in touch with me through my Twitter handle at Jean underscore Lin, L-I-N. And I'll be there and I'll try to answer your questions. And I, I look forward to connect with more people. Well, thank you again so much. And as always, we appreciate our listeners. Uh, if you want to listen to some of our previous podcasts, you can find those on Google Play Music. We're on SoundCloud, Stitcher and iTunes. If you're listening to those podcasts and you want to leave a review or rate them, we'd appreciate that. That's always good. And please feel free to reach out to me. I'm on Twitter at A Langshire. And if you have any suggestions or comments that you'd like to see for a future podcast. And until then, I look forward to having you join us for another episode of What I Wish I Know. 